Hello, I'm Alex Blake, and I'm joined today by Gary Robinson, co-manager of the Bailey Gifford US Growth Trust. Welcome, Gary. Thank you, Alex. The pandemic that swept across the world this year has caused great suffering and loss, and restrictions have also been imposed in order to slow the spread of the virus. What impact has this had on the US Growth Trust portfolio? So we, we've seen big shifts in demand across a number of sectors of the economy. For example, in retail, consumers have been doing a lot more of their shopping online. In enterprise software, more people are working from home, which has led to a spike in demand for collaboration tools like Zoom's video conferencing software that we're using to record this today. And in the healthcare sector, um, patients have been turning to telemedicine services like the ones offered by Teladoc as a safer way to interact with the doctors. On the other hand, demand for real world services like uh, travel has been impacted negatively. Overall, our portfolio is geared into the digital economy, so it's been on the right side of a lot of these demand shifts. But it's important to emphasize that while it's good to see so many of our holdings supporting the economy through these difficult times, the key question for us to consider as long-term investors is whether the current period will lead to any enduring changes. Um, and, and one of the things which is striking to me is how early we are in the digital transformation. The internet's been around for years and yet most of the world still happens offline. You know, take e-commerce as an example. In the US, only 16% of retail sales were online prior to the pandemic. And that's one of the most mature geographies in the world. Or take the medical sector, you know, why is it that over 95% of doctors' visits have historically been done in person when we have the technology to do them via telemedicine? And I think the answer to these questions is simply that we do things this way because we've always done things this way. You know, our actions today are largely a function of habit and inertia. You know, in my mind, online shopping is clearly superior to bricks and mortar retail. You know, you get access to lower prices, better selection, and it's often more convenient. And yet, you know, whilst e-commerce has been growing, it's been a slow and steady grind higher rather than a tipping point. Um, and that's why the current situation is interesting with regards to long-term change, because suddenly, out of necessity, um, people are being forced to shift their habits and try the alternative approach. And this trial, I think, will result in some permanent changes because when consumers do try the alternatives, I think it will be a, become apparent to them that in many cases, you're not in every single case, but in many cases, that the new way of doing things is better than the old way. And so what we're arguably seeing right now is a pull forward of the future uh, by, by several years rather than a one-off demand spike. You know, in, in e-commerce, Amazon hasn't been able to keep up with demand and has had to hire an additional 175,000 workers. Wayfair, the online furnishings retailer, has seen its revenue growth rate accelerate from 20% at the beginning of the year to over 80% in the second quarter. Now, that's a, that's a lot of new people trying the new way. Uh, Teladoc, the provider of telemedicine services, has seen its um, uh, visits grow over 200% in Q2. You know, most people in the U.S. have had access to telemedicine, but only about one in 10 used it historically. Um, but when these new consumers have tried telemedicine for the first time, we're seeing very, very high levels of, of satisfaction. And I think many of them will continue using this service post-pandemic. And then there's the home working situation and, uh, and what many people have, have, have been doing for the last six months. You know, why is it that, that many of us go into an office from nine to five? You know, is it because it's the best way? I don't think so. I think it's because it's how we've always done it. You know, the, the nine to five was designed for the industrial revolution when people had to be together in the same place at the same time to make things. In, in the information economy, in, in a lot of cases, that's no longer necessary. And so I think, um, you know, people will go back to offices to some extent, but it won't be the same. And there'll be a completely different attitude towards homeworking. And, you know, Zoom, um, the, the, the video conferencing company um, that we own in the portfolio stands, stands to benefit from this. Now, please don't take any of this as a prediction of what's going to happen next. It, it's going to be very hard for companies to sustain the growth rates that we've seen recently. Uh, but the current period has broken people's habits and it's shown many consumers that the benefits, um, the benefits that the digital economy has to offer. 
And in terms of our companies, you know, we've been very impressed by how they've managed to adapt and scale uh, to meet the, the recent spikes in demand, which I think has given us greater conviction in, in their cultures and in their business models for the future. Thank you. And I'm sure we've all been contributing to some of these behavioural shifts you talked about. What changes have you made to the portfolio over the last year? Yeah, so we invest on a five to ten year time horizon. Portfolio turnover remains very low and we haven't made any changes to the portfolio because of the pandemic. You know, the top ten holdings at the end of the reporting period were almost identical to the top ten holdings a year ago. But there have been some new buys and, and sales. So in terms of public companies, we took new positions in video conferencing company Zoom and telemedicine company Teladoc towards the end of last year. But obviously, at that point in time, we had no idea that they'd be playing such an important role in supporting the economy in the pandemic. The, um, the source of enthusiasm for, for those companies with long-term structural opportunity in, in front of them. Um, we've also added some new names, um, to some, new, some new public companies in, in the enterprise software space. So Workday, the cloud HR and finance software company, uh, Twilio, the cloud communications provider, and web security company Cloudflare. And we've continued to build our exposure to private companies. So, so we added eight new um, private companies in the period across a very broad range of business models and sectors. So, for example, uh, Ginkgo Bioworks, a synthetic biology company, uh, Stripe, the payments platform, um, Snowflake, the cloud data analysis company, and uh, Warby Parker, the uh, direct consumer prescription glasses company. So we're, lot, we're continuing to find um, lots of really exciting um, opportunities, particularly in the private space. That's great. Can you give us an example of an area you're really excited about? Sure. Um, yeah. So one area we're really excited about is, is what I would call cloud-based infrastructure platforms. I mentioned Stripe earlier. Um, that's a great example of one of these. So Stripe's aim is to make um, sending and receiving money as easy as transferring in information online. The financial system is really complex and it's very, very hard to navigate. Um, so Stripe's platform interacts with this um, uh, financial system on behalf of its customers and manages the complexity. And all a company uh, needs to do is plug into Stripe with a few lines of code and then it can accept money in over 100 countries around the world. And we own other cloud infrastructure platforms in the portfolio which are performing a similar role but in different sectors. So. You know, Shopify is a platform that allows companies to easily access um, tools for e-commerce. Amazon's AWS is a platform for renting IT infrastructure on demand. Um, and Twilio, which is another recent new purchase, allows companies to easily build communications functionality into their applications. And what all of these businesses have in common is that they sit above institutions or networks of hardware and manage the complexity of these networks on behalf of their customers. Um, and one of the really important implications of the emergence of these platforms is that, you know, collectively, they're making it much, much easier and much less expensive to start a company. So rather the, than building out expensive infrastructure ahead of demand, um, entrepreneurs can just hook into these cloud infrastructure platforms and, and rent what they need when they need it. So in essence, what the likes of Stripe and Shopify are doing is, is making it much easier to start and scale a business, which is great news for the health of the economy. Um, and all four of the platforms that I mentioned um, have the potential to be very valuable in their own right. They operate in you know, trillion dollar industries. Um, their business models generate flywheel effects, causing them to get stronger as they grow. They have interesting cultures, they're a founder run, mission-driven, innovative, and uh, run for the long term. Um, and in lowering barriers to entrepreneurship, they're performing a really critical role for society in improving the vitality of the global economy. And, and they've become even more important in, in, in recent times as the world has started to shift online even faster than ever. They sound like some really fascinating companies. What's your long-term outlook? Since we launched the trust, we've been saying consistently that we think technology will become ubiquitous over the course of the next decade and extend into all parts of society. And, you know, we acknowledge the challenges of looking forward right now and indeed at any time, but, you know, our confidence in, in this assertion is as high as ever. Innovation is continuing at a rapid pace, which bodes really well for the long term. 
you know, it was really fantastic to see SpaceX sending astronauts to the International Space Station recently. Because this is, this is something that, that only countries used to be able to do, and now we have a private company doing it. You know, innovation is really spreading out and, and starting to impact lots more sectors of the economy, which is creating a really rich pipeline of ideas across a broad range of business models and a broad range of industries. And we think the US Growth Trust is really well placed to capitalize on this, given its long-term approach and the flexibility that it has to invest across both the public and the private opportunity set. Gary, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much, Alex. For more information, please visit baileygifford.com.